Well, I am so excited about starting this series, Take the Plunge. It's all about water baptism. I don't know if you're the kind of person that likes to watch or engage or maybe even attend really highbrow ceremonies, events. Maybe you're one of those who watch the royal wedding. Anybody watch the royal wedding or the presidential inauguration? But there are those real big highbrow events that are full of pomp and circumstance. And if you've ever watched one, it kind of makes an indelible impression on you. It's something you remember watching. I know folks that were alive when President Kennedy was assassinated, and they remember watching his funeral and and the impact of that. We have those moments that that, that kind of memorialize something that's huge in our lives, huge in our culture, huge in the world in which we live. Because we have learned as a people, there's no culture in the world that doesn't point to those big significant moments in some way, shape, or form. Because we treat the meaningful moments in our lives in meaningful ways. That's a fundamental truth. We treat the meaningful moments in our lives in meaningful ways. It doesn't matter what it is. We memorialize, we mark births by celebrating birthdays. We mark Weddings by celebrating anniversaries. We mark death by funerals. We mark different events and meaning, meaningful events in different ways because it makes an impression on us. It's something that we remember because it separates the trivial. It separates the normal, everyday routine of life from that which carries a lot of weight for you and for me. It's true in the natural world, and it's also true in our spiritual lives. In our spiritual lives, when we mark those events, it's called a sacrament. Now, a sacrament comes from the word or builds off of the idea of something that is sacred. So a sacrament is something that conveys the sacred to us. Now, in the Christian world, there are only two sacraments that have been universally accepted since the birth, uh, the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. Some people believe there's more, different, but the two that everyone agrees on are the sacrament of baptism and communion. Baptism and communion. Now, actually, later on uh, this morning, we're going to celebrate communion together. We're going to come together and celebrate communion, the Lord's Supper. Depending on your background, you might call it the Eucharist. The, the broken body that's represented in the bread and the shed blood that's represented in the cup of our Lord Jesus Christ. But before we do that, I want to talk this morning a bit about baptism because we mark things that are important to us. Who knows what Wednesday is? Fourth of July. Why do we remember the Fourth of July? Because it marks the day that the U.S. declared its independence, the United States, the 13 colonies, declared their independence from the British Empire. So we're really the only country that celebrates the 4th of July. I know that's a shock. Well, in the same way, when we come to Christ in faith, in baptism, what we're doing is we are declaring not our independence, but our dependence on God. It's something that we need to mark. It's something that we need to remember because the most important event in a human life is the moment when someone comes to Christ. The most important, there'll be people who will say the most important day is when you find your purpose. It's not because if you find your purpose and you're not found in Christ, then you miss the whole point. The most important event is when you come to faith in Christ. That is more important than any other day. It's more important than your 50th anniversary. It's more important than when you retire. It's more important than the day that you ask the question to the girl and she says yes. I know it's a shock that it's more important. But imagine having a marriage where Christ isn't the center of it. I know people who have that and it's horrible. The most important event in a human life is the moment when someone comes to Christ. And we need to memorialize that. We need to mark that. As a matter of fact, that's what baptism is all about. It's about declaring, I have come to faith in Jesus Christ. And I'm here to tell you this morning that some of you who are followers of Jesus need to take the plunge and say, I'm going to be water baptized. I'm a follower of Jesus, but I've never actually done that. So this morning we're going to unpack what it means to be water baptized, or at least start. We're going to do this uh, 
talk about baptism for the next three weeks, but this morning we're going to talk about the idea that baptism is so much more than water. It's more than just getting wet. It's more than just going in a tank and getting dunked and coming out or going to a pool or going to a river or going to any body of water. It's much more deep than that. Here's what it says in the book of Acts, chapter 2. Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Be baptized, every one of you. It's not an option. It's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's an expectation. If you're a follower of Jesus, you ought to be water baptized. And so... We want to look at the reasons why, what it means, where it comes from. Because believe it or not, there are a lot of people who think that John the Baptist invented baptism. That's why his last name is Baptist. That, in, that it didn't exist. If you read the Bible, now the Bible is broken into two parts. The Old Testament, which is before Jesus came. And then the New Testament, which is when Jesus came and then what happened after his death and resurrection. And if you read the Bible, the Old Testament, the word baptism is never once mentioned. It's not there. And therefore, some people say baptism didn't exist until John the Baptist, because that's what he was known for. But the reality is, baptism in the Old Testament happened all the time. The reason we don't see the word baptism in the Old Testament is because it's a Greek word. And the Old Testament was written primarily in Hebrew. So the word baptism wouldn't appear there. But if you read through the law, the books of the law, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, you see the idea of baptism mentioned over and over and over. So while the word baptism does not appear in the Old Testament, the practice certainly does. The practice does. You read in the law, there are times when, when the Jewish people are commanded to wash themselves. Now, the word baptism means to immerse, to dip, to plunge into water. And in the Old Testament, they're commanded to plunge themselves, to immerse themselves, full immersion in water for different reasons. Women, at the end of their monthly cycle, after sexual intimacy, men and women were both commanded to be baptized, although they didn't use the word baptism. If you converted to Judaism, you had to be baptized. If you committed certain... um, If you broke certain laws, certain of the laws, you had to be baptized. As a matter of fact, uh, even today, if you buy utensils, if you're an Orthodox Jew and you buy utensils from someone who is not Jewish, you have to baptize them. Otherwise, you violate the teaching of your rabbi. So over time, the Jews developed a system in which it was easier to immerse yourselves And they built these, um, uh, um, I guess what you would call structures, called mikvahs. And a mikvah is made out of stone. And you step down, it's about usually seven steps. And they represent the seven days of creation. There's a reason for everything. You'd step down and you'd wash yourself. In In the Old Testament, you actually had to do that before you even went into the temple and into many synagogues. And so I was just over in Israel and we saw these a lot of places in different excavations. So here's what an ancient mikvah would look like. This one was outside of the temple in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount. And you could see there, you'd walk down the steps, that would be full of water. You would go in by yourself, immerse yourself in the water, come out, now you're clean, now you're cleansed of your impurities, and you could go into the temple. It had nothing to do with the forgiveness of sins. It had everything to do with being clean, being cleansed, being uh, any impurities in you, on you, would be removed. See, in the Old Testament, baptism marked a person as having been cleansed. I'm cleansed. And so the idea, the practice was there all throughout the Old Testament. Then all of a sudden, we get to the New Testament, and this guy, John the Baptist, explodes on the scene. And he teaches something that's completely revolutionary. He says, come to me, I want to baptize you in the Jordan River, not to cleanse you from ritual impurity. I want to baptize you because you have turned back to God. 
I want to baptize you because you have acknowledged that you have sinned in some way, that you have turned away from God. But if you turn back to God with your heart and repent, I want to baptize you to prepare you for what's to come because there is someone who's about to show up on the scene. God himself, Messiah, Emmanuel, God incarnate. So John baptized people who turned back to God. That's what John did. He baptized people who turned back to God. Here's how it says it in the book of Matthew. It says, In those days, John the Baptist came to the Judean wilderness and began preaching his message. And it was this, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. Repent. Turn from your sins. Be baptized, for the kingdom of heaven is near. And so they heard this, and it changed the way they looked at the idea of baptism. It was no longer come and be cleansed because of an impurity in your life. It was come and confess and admit what you've done. Turn your heart back towards God. And then it goes on. It says, People from Jerusalem and from all of Judea and all over the Jordan Valley went out to see and hear John. And they confessed their sins. And he baptized them in the Jordan River. He baptized them. It was no longer you could do this on your own in a mikvah. They found mikvahs in people's basements, outside of synagogues, all over the place. It may have been done in public, but it really wasn't a public demonstration. Simply where water was. John is saying, you're doing this in public. You're coming and confessing, and now you're declaring to everyone, I am turning back my heart to God. I'm turning back. I want to change. I want to be different. So John's baptism was not about being clean, but coming clean. I've done this. I've messed up. I've turned from God. It's not about being clean, looking clean, appearing clean, going through some ritual. It was about saying, I am coming clean with all the things that I've done, the things that I've done wrong, and I want to change. But John understood something. John understood that his baptism was simply to prepare people. His baptism wasn't the final baptism. His baptism, his baptism was almost the segue. You had the Old Testament way of baptism, which was all about externals. And he knew that Messiah, Jesus, Emmanuel, God in the flesh was about to come. And when he showed up, he would inaugurate a new type of baptism, which wouldn't be about externals at all. It would be about transformation. But in between... He said, I have to begin to prepare your hearts to receive God when he shows up in the flesh. And here's what it says in Matthew chapter 3. Then Jesus went from Galilee to the Jordan River to be baptized by John, but John tried to talk Jesus out of it. You ever try and convince God he's wrong? I've done it. it. I never win. You know, the Lord tells you to do something, but God, that doesn't make sense. Just trust me. So here's Jesus. He shows up. He says, John, now John's his cousin. They're related. He's his second cousin. And he says, I need to be baptized. And John says, no, Jesus, no, I shouldn't baptize you. As a matter of fact, I am the one who needs to be baptized by you. So why are you coming to me? Why are you coming to me? But John is... is and the reason he doesn't want to be baptized is he's looking past. He knows what, he understands prophetically what it is that Jesus is going to do. He understands, he's gotten insight from the Holy Spirit what's going to happen. But Jesus goes on and it says, But Jesus said, It should be done, for we must carry out all that God requires. So John agreed to baptize him. John says, Okay, Jesus, if you really think this is a good idea, I'll do it. But John understood that his baptism. What he was doing, it was only the beginning. It wasn't the end, that Jesus had a new type of baptism. So why is it? Why is it that the one person who would never need to be baptized was baptized? Think about Jesus. He didn't need to be purified, uh, ritual purification. He didn't need to repent and come back to God and turn his back his heart back toward God. He was God in the flesh. He was perfect, uh, in perfect relationship with God the Father. He didn't need to come back to God. He was God. Why in the world was Jesus baptized? The biggest reason is this. Jesus wanted to make sure we knew how important it is to be baptized. He wanted you and me to know this 
is important. This isn't optional. At one point, Jesus washes his disciples' feet and he says, Now I have given you an example. Go and do likewise. He's talking about the act of serving, but he's also talking about his entire life and ministry. Look at how I live. Look at the things I've done. Look at the example I set for you and follow my example. So Jesus says, I was baptized. It would be a good idea for you to be. I want you to be baptized. As a matter of fact, and we're going to touch on this next week at the end of the Gospel of Matthew. Now, the Gospels are simply the biographies of Jesus' life, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. At the end of Matthew, he commands us to go make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Jesus is saying, by my example and my words, this is what I want you to do. I want you to be baptized. Because something happens. There is something sacred in baptism. It's when, when you enter into a sacrament, we have to understand there's two realities. When you are baptized, when you receive communion, you're both stepping into a sacred moment, a sacred place, a sacred event. You're stepping into that, and that sacred, sacredness, whether it's um, the communion that's coming into you, into your body, whether it's you going into the water, it's you are both stepping into the sacred and the sacred is coming into you. Because in baptism, baptism is not just about water. Baptism is about what happens in your life when you are water baptized. See, everything about baptism is symbolic. Everything about baptism is symbolic. I want to say this. I want to be abundantly clear. I'm going to come back to it in just a few minutes. Baptism does not save you. If it did, you could be saved by works. But the Bible clearly teaches we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. So baptism doesn't save us. But baptism is, is symbolic. It represents things that God is doing in us and through us. And, and there's also a spiritual component of things that come alive in us when we are water baptized. So you're not saved through water baptism. But water baptism is more than just getting wet. It's symbolic, it's meaningful, it's sacred. But where and how, because it's symbolic, that means you don't have to, like I said, I was just in Israel, you don't have to go to the Jordan River and be baptized in a location where you think Jesus may have been baptized. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if it's in a pool, it doesn't matter if it's in a church, it doesn't matter if it's in a lake, it doesn't matter where you're baptized. It matters that you're baptized. In Romans chapter 6, it says this, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. And then it goes on and says, In order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's symbolic. It represents that when we go down into the water, we're dying to our old way of living. When we come up out of the water, we have a new life. It represents, as we read in Acts, it says, Be baptized, every one of you, that you may receive the Holy Spirit. It represents the washing away of our sins. It represents the coming of the Holy Spirit. It represents a clean conscience before God. The baptism of Jesus is about what you have received. I've received a new life. I've received a clean conscience. I've received power. It's not about the externals looking clean. And it's not even about coming clean and confessing what you've done. It's now about saying, I have placed my faith in Christ. And because of that, this is what I've received. And through the water of baptism, all of that is made real. It comes alive in me. And without the act of water baptism, you never receive all that God has for you. 1 Peter chapter 3, it says this, Baptism, which corresponds to this, now to this, he's talking about, just before that, he's talking about how God saved Noah and his family through the waters of the flood. Baptism, which corresponds to this, now saves you, not as a removal of dirt from the body, but as an appeal to God for a good conscience through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now you can read that and say, well, then I'm saved by baptism. That's not what it means at all. Just like God saved Noah through the flood. 
This is what it's saying. Again, if you're saved by baptism, you're saved by works. What this is saying is just as God was faithful to save Noah through the flood, so when you are baptized, you can realize that I know God will bring me safely into his kingdom. Baptism reminds us that by placing our faith in Christ, God will bring us safely into his kingdom. That's what it's teaching us. That God says, now you've come to me, and you've stood for me, and you've declared to everyone that I am a follower of Jesus. And he says, great, now I will see you safely through. I will walk with you. I will, I will carry you. I will, just as God looked at Noah, and it says, God remembered Noah. Does it mean he forgot about Noah and then said, oh, yeah, there's an ark and some people. I forgot about them. Remember means Noah and his family were constantly at the forefront of God's mind. That's what that word remember means in the Hebrew language. That they were constantly there and God was watching over. He remembered them and remembered them and remembered them. And when you're water baptized, you're saying, God, I know you're going to remember me and remember me. And when I'm going through the hard times and when everything's falling apart, you're going to remember me. You're going to see me through. And when things are great, you're not going to let me get so full of myself that I'll turn my back on you. And the act of baptism is hugely important. Now, why is it important? Why is baptism so important? There's a lot of reasons. I just want to touch on two. The, the first one is this. It's a big way that we acknowledge God. It's a big way that we acknowledge him. Think about it. We mark all these events. We said earlier, we mark all these events in our lives with some type of memorial. And if the most important event in someone's life is the moment they come to faith in Jesus Christ, shouldn't we mark that? And so God looks at us and says, I want you to mark it. I don't want you to just mark it so you remember for you. I want you to do this so that everyone will know where you stand. You have moved from this family to my family. You have moved from living for yourself to living for me. You have moved from thinking that you could do what you want, when you want, how you want it, to say, I will be submitted and I will follow God and I will do what he asks me to do no matter what it costs me. Why do you think so often in Jesus' life he tells people, give away your riches, repay those that you've stolen from? Because he's saying, will you follow me regardless of what it costs you? So at the very front of your conversion experience, the very beginning when you move from the, your own way of living into God's family, he says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to declare to everybody where you stand. And you acknowledge it in front of everyone. It's not like the Old Testament. You can't go down to your basement, just you by yourself. This is with other people present. It may not be everyone that you know. It may not be all your friends and family, but there are those who are there that witness it. Because it's the way that we acknowledge him. In Matthew chapter 10, it says, Everyone who acknowledges me, Jesus is speaking, everyone who acknowledges me before men, I will also acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. If you acknowledge me, I'll acknowledge you. When you go in front of people and you are water baptized, you are acknowledging He is now my Lord and my Savior. I am more committed to Him than any human institution. And if I'm asked to violate my commitment to Him or to something else, I will stay true to God no matter what. But then Jesus goes on and says, but whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father. Now that can be denying with your words, and it can be denying with your actions. So I want to lay something out for you. If you're a follower of Jesus, and you might be a follower of Jesus for three days, three weeks, three months, 30 years, I don't care how long you've been a Christian, if you refuse to be baptized, it's denying him. To refuse to be baptized is to deny God. You're you're denying him by your actions. Now, I would love to soften that. I'd love to skate around it. I'd love to say, well, you know, I, I get it. it. You know, it's not something you want to do. You have a phobia of water. I remember baptizing a young man once. He wanted to be baptized so badly, and he was scared to death of water. And he was terrified. He got into the tank, and he stood there, I mean, like a board. I'm trying to get him to, I'm trying to, get him to go down. He wouldn't. I mean, he just stood there. 
Now, we're in a tank. Nobody could see my legs. So this is what I, I honest to God, this, I, leg, I gave him a leg sweep. <laughs> Nobody could see. I mean, he, he just went down. I forget, it was this way, and I just went, and he went down. And because he fought it so bad, I held him down longer. No. <laughs> I thought, this poor kid, I got him up as quick as I could. But to deny, to, to refuse to be baptized is to deny Christ. It's to say, I know you've asked this of me, but I refuse to do it. And if you won't acknowledge him in front of people, he won't acknowledge you to his heavenly father. See, there is no instance recorded in the scriptures after the, the birth of the church on the day of Pentecost. There's no, there's no uh, record of someone who comes to faith in Christ and refuses to be water baptized. Everyone, when they came to faith in Christ, knew that the next step was water baptism. You're saved, you're water baptized. You put your faith in Christ, you're water baptized. It was a way of making a public acknowledgement of your faith. And if someone didn't understand what baptism was, that they were supposed to be water baptized, as soon as they found out about it, they were water baptized. So there's these guys who hear the gospel and it's preached to them by this guy named Apollos. There's 12 men, they hear Apollos preach, and they believe in Jesus, and they're baptized, but they're not baptized in the baptism of Christ, which is about what you've received, what you've become. They were baptized in the baptism of John. They said, we've confessed our sin, and now we want our hearts to be open to God. Their hearts weren't in the wrong place, but they misunderstood what baptism was, that it had changed between the Old Testament to John to Jesus. And so Paul shows up, And he hears their story about how they came to faith, and he says, whoa, 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 tell me about this baptism experience. And this is what it says. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. They didn't say, well, I was baptized already once. I was baptized as a child. We're going to talk about that next week. We're going to do a message next week called Don't Hold Back. What are those things that hold you back from being baptized? And sometimes it's, well, I was baptized as an infant, as a toddler. But you weren't baptized since you made the choice to place your faith in Jesus Christ. And these 12 men had already placed their faith in Jesus Christ. They just didn't understand what baptism was. And so they were baptized again because they said, we want to acknowledge publicly our faith in Jesus Christ. So why is it important? One, it's because it's how we acknowledge God. Two, it's an act of obedience. It's an act of obedience. When we come to faith in Christ, God could have asked us anything. Think about it. God could have said, you are saved from an eternity, separated from me in the worst condition you can imagine. If you think 100 degrees in Delaware in July is bad, you would be, you'll be praying for that in eternity in hell. And I saved you from that. I've saved you from darkness and weeping and, and just the horror of hell for all eternity. I've saved you from that. He could have asked you for anything. What does he ask us to do? Be baptized. Get in the water and be baptized. Be baptized. Make a declaration. Let people see it is how we obey. See, as a Christian, we say, I'll follow God. I'll do whatever he asks me to do. God, I'll follow you. I'll serve you. I'm submitted to you. I'm going to obey you. And he says, be baptized. I don't want to do that. If you're not willing to follow God at the very beginning, how are you going to follow him days, weeks, months, and years down the road? You'll constantly be fighting that. See, baptism sets the stage for your entire relationship with Christ. Now, I know some of you are thinking, well, it's been a long time since I've been a Christian and I haven't been baptized. Well, if you get baptized, it will jumpstart your relationship with Christ. It will draw you closer to him because he's going to look and say, now you're being obedient. See, there are some of you here who have never been water baptized. You're a follower of Christ, but you've never been water baptized. And here's what it says in the book of Acts. What are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Get up and be baptized. What's the problem? Now, I know some of you here, you have been water baptized, and that's wonderful, and that's exciting, but some of you have never done it. And so in two weeks, 
Two weeks from today, we're going to have a baptism service. During our gathering time at 10.30 on Sunday morning, right after uh, we finish up the message, we're going to have baptism right here on stage. Some of you have already gone online and signed up, and that's wonderful, but for some of you, it is a take-the-plunge moment. Or you say, I don't care what people think. I don't care how long I've been a Christian. I need to do this. Because I've never understood what it meant. I never understood the importance of it. And I need to do that. So if you, if you have signed up, we're so excited. If you haven't, there's two simple ways to do it. Go to hickoryridgecc.org slash baptism. And there's a form right there. It'll take you about 15 seconds to sign up. Sign up to be baptized. Or... At the guest service table on your way out, there's these baptism cards. Look just like that. It says baptism on the front. We wanted to make it easy. <laughs> Fill out the back. Leave it at the guest service. Uh, whoever's at the guest service table, give it to them, and we will be in touch with you over the next two weeks and give you all the details that you need to be ready for July 15th. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be a celebration. It'll be a day that you can mark. I acknowledge God publicly. And I took a step of obedience that I had never taken before. So maybe you're still struggling with this. And you're wondering, should I be baptized? Shouldn't I be baptized? I don't know. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be baptized. I'm just telling you. It's not an option. It's not a suggestion. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be baptized. And you say, well, I don't know if all my family can be here. If you're a follower of Jesus, you should be baptized. Don't wait and you're struggling with it. You're saying, but it's weird and it's awkward and it's kind of countercultural. I get all that. It's not something we normally do in our culture, really outside of, of the religious setting, the Christian setting. And so you go, it, it seems weird. What you need to do is ask yourself this question Why would you not do something Jesus has asked you to do? Jesus asked you to be baptized. Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you do it? Why wouldn't you do the very thing that Jesus said, you've placed your faith in me, now go be baptized? Now, I know some of you have been. Some of you were baptized years ago, decades ago, long before I've ever met you. Some of you have been baptized since I've been here as the pastor over the last five years. I want to say to those of you who have been baptized, I am so proud of you because it's an act of obedience. It's a way to acknowledge God before everyone. Don't ever lose sight of it. Memorialize it. Think back on it. Maybe it's so long ago you haven't thought about it until this morning when I'm talking about baptism. You ought to think about that moment. You ought to reflect on it regularly. Say, God, I remember that day. And it meant something. It wasn't just to commemorate my faith. It was so that I would know all that I have become, all that I can receive as a follower of your son, Jesus. Don't ever forget that. But it's not just that I'm proud of you. Your heavenly Father is proud of you. So here's Jesus. He convinces John to let him be baptized, and this is what it says. It says, When Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, descending like a, go- a dove and coming to rest on him. Behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. God is pleased with you when you take that step of obedience and you're water baptized because you're following the example of Jesus. You're acknowledging God before the eyes of the world. And you are saying, I will do the things that God has asked me to do. Here's the amazing truth. Baptism is a moment on earth which is marked in heaven. Baptism is a moment on earth which is marked in heaven. So I'm going to ask if the worship team would come up In just a few moments, we're going to play a song, and during that song, we're going to pass out the communion elements. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you've placed your faith in Christ, we invite you to partake in communion with us this morning. We're going to pass the bread and the cup, and during this song, I want you to hold it. But I want to start by asking you to consider this question. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you've placed your faith in Jesus, and you've never been water baptized, ask yourself this question, what is holding me back. What is holding me back? And we're going to dive more into that next week. We say don't hold back, but what is holding me back? And as the worship team plays this song, and as you receive the cup and the bread, here's what I want to encourage you. Don't let anything hold you back. 
Don't let anything hold you back. Before you even get the cup, before you get the bread, get on your phone and sign up to be baptized. Run to the back, get a card, fill it out and sign up to be baptized. So that when you receive the second sacrament this morning, the sacrament of communion, you can identify in it different than you ever have before. Because now it's not just acknowledging the death and the resurrection of Jesus for you. It's acknowledging that you have died and been raised from the dead with him. Let's stand together.